The world is mine, nigga, get back. Don't fuck with my stack. The gauge is whack. About to drop the bomb, I'm the motherfucking Don. Both teams get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's bored. We like the asset. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. He will defend his police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the courts. We enforce them. But at the end of the day, each and every man is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary, you need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is... October 11th, 2016, and we're coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All Network, which now runs, actually, it's the Nonpartisan Liberty for All radio and Media and Radio Network. I'm forgetting the um, name of my own network. Actually, I wrote it down wrong. So I'm going to fix that. Media and Radio Network, which now (laughs) runs 24-7. And you can listen live on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com and to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't interfere with their freedom. Exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And they also rule with something uh, they don't have, authority. They have no authority. And I might add this to my intro or redo my intro, but the thing that people forget about is that the government's authority is a bunch of men with guns. And that's it. You know, you may... uh, Somebody brought out a point, I think it was Ken Shorgen, who will be joining us tomorrow night. He joins us every other Wednesday to talk about geopolitics in the economy but was that well some people essentially are ruled by money um or it wasn't ruled it was more they comply so they comply because they get a monthly check or they comply because they feel an obligation or whatever and that may be the case however at the same time it's enforced by threat of force and violence. If you decide not to comply because of that, then the result is going to be violence. So even though a bunch of people may comply because they're brainwashed to or because they get a check or food stamps from the government and they've been bought off essentially, Uh, It doesn't mean that it's still not based on um, threat of force because bottom line is it is. It doesn't mean that every single person is complying because of threat of force. If they're not, I would say they're ignorant. And ignorance doesn't mean you're stupid, and I've explained this before. So if I use the word ignorant, it's look up the the definition of ignorant it's it's almost like uh it's similar to naive it's you know you just don't know 
the truth. You don't know what really goes on. So I would consider those people ignorant, not stupid. Uh, I mean, I've I said this before. You have obviously all of these scholars and supposedly um, geniuses that believe in the whole concept of government and what they're doing. And would somehow defend it. I don't know. You know, I know all the the bullshit defenses that people use because they all say the same thing. You know, it's, well, you have to help support the community and you have to pay taxes to help support that. And all like all this bullshit that each point can be refuted down to the detail. Um, I mean, there are some points that you could say, well, what would you do about this? And what would you do about that? And does everyone have the specific answer? I mean, there's a lot of answers and there's a lot of options and there's a lot of different ways to do things. Just like when they wrote the constitution, everything wasn't mapped out and now they come up with they they still come up with situations where they don't know how to handle it and then they make a stupid fucking law for it. So anyway, tonight we're going to be talking all about the U- UN and their agenda uh their revised agenda that's supposed to run until uh, 2030. Uh, the specific name of it I do have uh, somewhere. I actually have these. this document you can download. Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Global Action, which is the final draft of the outcome document for the UN Summit to adopt the post-2015 development agenda. And I had went over this before, um, maybe a couple of years ago when I had started the show or maybe a year into the show or something like that, where I actually went through and read most of the document. It's not that long, but it's long enough. I mean, it's 30 something pages. And when you're reading something like that, it's, it's, it's just monotonous and it's, you know, going through all this shit. And at the same time, you're trying to, really figure out the meaning behind what they're trying to say. And I, I mentioned this a lot, um, but I don't really go into details. I mentioned how they want to, uh, take, have all the rich countries and it actually spelled it out in the, in the draft that I read. I don't know if they've taken it out of this one. I went through it, but I didn't read the whole thing, but they were planning on the richer countries giving to the poorer countries. So it's it's based on um, things. It, it's kind of based on what the government agenda is now, to be honest. It's based on things like redistribution of wealth, making everybody equal. It's something you would see in one of those fucking um, scary movies in the future that are not supposed to be scary in the terms of a horror movie, but are scary because they're about just making people equal like Harrison Bergeron. I don't know if people have read that short story. I think it was Kurt Vonnegut who had read, uh, wrote that where they actually put on, uh, and I've talked about this before, but they put on um, these bands on people. They actually bands on their head, meaning they actually made a, uh, I think it was like a TV movie, or I'm, I don't know if it was, it wasn't an after school special, but I, I think it was a TV movie that might have aired on like HBO or something. And it had Sean Austin in it. It probably came out, I'm thinking late 90s. I remember reading this story in school, but the movie was a lot more. Uh, hard hitting in my opinion and and really they should have made an actual uh feature film off of this and and added to it you know made a, a film based off the short story that changed a lot of the things because i think the movie was only an hour i don't know if it was actually a movie per se and i could be wrong it could be a full 
uh, length. But, um, I mean, you could make like a two and a half hour blockbuster movie about this. Of course, they wouldn't make a blockbuster about it because it's exactly what they want to do. Um, I don't know that they want to do it in the same way. But what they did was they took these um, things that they would put on their heads uh, that they had invented that would make people stupider. So it would suppress your intelligence. And Sean Austin was just so smart that it just broke, basically. He it couldn't contain his brain. That rhymes. I'm gonna put that in a rap song. Um but um he because he was so smart, they took him to the underground people that were really running the whole country. So the president was elected via lottery, literal like playing the lottery. <laughs> and um I don't think you got the play. I think they just like selected you're the president and uh because it didn't matter. It, it people don't really mention this that much and I'm really surprised. I don't think I've ever heard anybody mention Harrison Bergeron and it's been like I said the the story which was from what I remember when I read it I'm gonna look it up right now it was short and the movie you know didn't get a lot of exposure but it was on you know either uh, HBO or Showtime and I never really heard anybody mention this on because you would think even supposed, you know, conservatives would mention this because it's a metaphor for communism to an extent and socialism making everybody equal. But at the same time, it's a metaphor for an oligarchy. It's pretty much what they're trying to do now in a sense. So um, I'm surprised I never heard anybody mention it. I may have once or twice, but not as much as, you know, 1984 is mentioned all the time. And I don't know, to me, I I didn't read the book, but I did see the movie. I have it on DVD. And maybe because it was overhyped to me, I, I don't know. I just expected uh, more. So, it was a uh, satir- they call it a satirical and dystopian science fiction short short story by Kurt Vonnegut. This is a, uh, according to Wikipedia, originally published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and the story was republished in the author's Welcome to the Monkey House uh, collection in 1968. And I don't remember what grade I had read this in, but I guess it takes place. In 2081, um, amendments to the Constitution dictate that all Americans are fully equal and not allowed to be smarter, better looking, or more physically able than anyone else. And the handicapper general agents enforce the equality laws forcing citizens to wear handicaps. Um, I forgot about this. Yeah, masks for people who, who are too beautiful, radios inside the ears of intelligent people, and heavyweights for the strong or ath- athletic. So Harrison Bergeron was intelligent, and he would have to wear the bands. But I think in the movie, they had actually, um, everybody had to wear the bands, no matter what, if you were smart or not. Like everybody in his class. I don't remember... I remember the main parts of the movie um, because I only seen it once and it was it came out in 95 on Showtime made a full length uh, made for TV adaptation with Sean Austin, as I had said. And it it, those were the things that I had remembered. And of course, the biggest part I remembered was the ending where or the uh, the biggest part, the the. Uh, most memorable and main uh, uh, part that I had uh, remembered was um, 
in the end, at least in the movie, I can't remember the story too well because it had to be either junior high or elementary school when we read the story. It was in like a book of stories. I guess back then they would allow something. I would seriously doubt you'd see this in any book now, but in either elementary school or junior high, they had a book of stories and, and this was in it. And it goes way beyond what I've said. I just, my memory, because it's been so long and I, you know, when I read it, it was a long time ago and I only read it once and I only saw the movie once, but, um, he gets on TV and blows his brains out to show everybody. Like he first, I think he tells everyone what's going on. You know, you essentially have this underground oligarchy that runs the government You have a president who is, at least this is in the movie, um, the president who is elected by lottery, who actually is funny, is played by the father from American Pie. Um, He's been in so many fucking movies. uh, I can't think of his name right now. Eugene Levy plays uh, the president. (laughs) It's funny. Um, I guess it was quoted by attorneys in a brief before the Kansas Supreme Court. So... Um, I've heard that Kurt Vonnegut was uh, lean towards anarchism, actually. Maybe not uh, or no government, but he had been uh, someone who supported freedom. Now, I don't know enough about him to know that. I know he was in Back to School. If you've seen the movie Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield, so he goes back to school. For people who haven't seen it, uh, rent it or get it on dvr or whatever um order it from uh, amazon it's probably cheap it came out in 86 but it's a funny ass fucking movie and rodney dangerfield is uh a rich millionaire who has this big business and he didn't i don't even think he graduated from high school and his son is going to college but his son's like i'm gonna drop out look at you and how successful you are and and he's like, well, I told you, if you without an education, you know, you're 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 nothing, which I, I think uh, has turned uh, proven to be bullshit. Um, or maybe education is not the word. Um, it's he said education, but you don't have to get an education from a university or from a government school. But I think education is important. It's just not schooling that's important. But. He had said, you know, I'll do it with you. So Rodney Dangerfield at like 60 something goes back to school. He doesn't have his high school transcripts or diploma. And it's funny because the fucking dean and people that have seen it are probably laughing right now. People that haven't are probably like, what the fuck is this motherfucker talking about? But so the dean was Dean Martin. And everybody knows who Dean Martin is just you know, even people that weren't alive, like I wasn't alive when Dean Martin was famous, but I know who Dean Martin is, member of the Brat Pack and, or the Rat Pack, (laughs) I'm thinking of the Brat Pack um, later in the 80s. Uh, But his last name was Martin and, you know, they have the Dean of the college. So (laughs) he called him Dean Martin. And, um, You know, he's like, how can I let somebody with no, it was the guy who got raped in deliverance, actually, Ned, Ned Beatty. Um, He's like, how can I let somebody with no real um, transcripts or, you know, no high school diploma into a prestigious school such as whatever the fuck the name of the school was. I think it was a made up school. And he's like, um, and he said, we're known for our, we're handpicked. We handpick our students from the creme de la creme. And he's like, that's what I like about this school, Dean Martin. And so he donates money. Um, and I'm going to f- totally forget my point. But um, now I remembered. So what what Rodney Dangerfield does <laughs> is in his English class, they have to do a paper on Kurt Vonnegut, right? So I didn't know Kurt Vonnegut was a lot like that young. I mean, I, I thought he was older for some reason, um, but he I know he's dead now, but he was still alive in 1986. And I think he even died not that long ago. Um, I'll have to look that up real quick. But um, yeah, Kurt Vonnegut was born in 
he died in 2007. Yeah. So he, he died um, nine years ago, April 11th, 2007 at 84. So yeah, he wasn't that old. Um, meaning, uh, you know, he wasn't from like the generation before that. Um, but I, uh, like he didn't live in the 1800s. I, I had, um, seen that movie so many times. And so he has to write a paper about Kurt Vonnegut and he hires Kurt Vonnegut to write it. Not only does he hire him to write it, but <laughs> the teacher who's played by Sally Kellerman, who he's trying to date, he's like, you know, I know you didn't write this paper and whatever. And whoever did doesn't know a thing about Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> it's funny because Kurt Vonnegut wrote the fucking paper. Um, I'm sorry. That was a long story to get to a, you know, semi good punchline, but, um, it's definitely a good movie. You should see it. But anyway, so he, I, I had heard that he was, you know, he leaned towards that. Now I could be totally off because I think I had heard that from, um, anarchist and this might've been later in his life. Um, that he had these these thoughts and and it might have just been you know something like that we will look into it and say okay well this must mean this and that he must have this view and it could have just been hey what if this happened and it it would be interesting and usually that's not the the case but i remember in film school where uh, in film theory and criticism, it was everything meant something. And I used to think, well, what if, and I still think this, what if this really didn't mean shit? It just fit nicely. Like, I didn't think every little detail stood for something. You know, they, the, the professor would go through, well, this and like Jaws or something. We were, I remember we watched like some scenes from that and this means this, and this is a metaphor for this and whatever. And it's like, okay, I, I buy into some of that, actually a lot of it, but as somebody who had to write a script for school for a full length um, fe feature film. And I thought about that. Because they teach you that. And then you start thinking about, well, maybe I can make this mean this and I can have this. And, and, but I didn't go to that extent where every little fucking detail meant something. So even in that, it could have been a, uh, story that he just came up with, you know, cause I guess he did a lot of satire um, again, I don't know enough about him to really know, but I did hear that. So I'll have to uh, look into that if, um, okay, it, well, this is just a note from Wikipedia. It says that um, he theorized that the story was a satire on American Cold War misunderstandings of communism and socialism. See, I didn't take it that way at all. I honestly took it because it's almost a reality now. So it was, I mean, parts of it were joke-like. Even in the in the movie, you know, especially in the book I, I, or in the story, they had some pictures of like um, how like the good looking people were you know, made to look fucked up and whatever. And, you know, with mask and made to look stupid and things like that. And, and it did, it was kind of weird in that sense. But later on, when I always looked at it, I looked at these couple things and in a genre that it says that he's known for is political fiction. Um, so I'll have to do some more research about him and, and see, and maybe I'll even do a show. That's a, it would be an interesting show about writers or, um, you know, even filmmakers that are, you know, don't believe in government or, or made uh, movies or writings about these types of things. But 
the way I took it was literally making everybody equal and having, but the, the part that to me really wasn't a joke is also that you had that oligarchy really. And at the time I didn't, you know, fuck, even when I saw the movie, when I was like 18, um, or 19 or something, um, I didn't know the definition of an oligarchy. I knew, uh, I guess what a group of people running the government would be or that the I had probably thoughts of you know people with money get away with every get away with a lot of shit and get away with um more than people that don't have money because we didn't have money. I mean we weren't poor like uh in poverty. Um I didn't grow up in poverty but didn't have money. I mean, you know, lived in an apartment until, geez, I didn't have my own room till I was 21, but it's not like I was in a room with like five people neither. I mean, just my brother, but I lived with my parents till I was 24 and I'm almost giving away my age, but, um, I, the last, like, three years I lived with them I finally had my own room which was like oh my god I felt like I grew up in jail um and that's more about my father but so we we grew up like I I wouldn't even say we were middle class because we didn't have a house we always had food we had clothes we didn't have to share pants you know like I hear about people that live in poverty. We weren't close to poverty. Okay. So I don't want to exaggerate when I say we didn't have money. We didn't have, we didn't go on vacations. I didn't go on a plane till I paid for, or actually they might've helped me pay for it, but to fly back from Vegas when I had moved out here the first time. Um, but we didn't go on any vacations. Like we go on a day vacation. So like, You know, the rich people, they go, they have cabins and shit, or they have, um, you know, uh, a summer home or some shit like that, or a condo somewhere. We would just go to, like, New Hampshire or um, usually New Hampshire, because they had all the parks, like the places you go to that during the summer, they're open, they're amusement parks. So we go there for the day. That would be our like vacation type shit that we do. So, I mean, we had enough money to do that. We go to the movies. I mean, it's not like I grew up, you know, in fucking, we grew up in a two room uh, apartment with, you know, and all slept in the same room. And, um, we did have one apartment with one bathroom and four people that, that wasn't too cool. But I mean, again, there's people with 10 people in a one room apartment. So that's not poverty. Um, you know, grow, having a apartment, you know, a two bedroom apartment with one bathroom and, you know, four people. Um, but that's not, you know, as far as, being a part of any type of class that got any respect or anything. I mean, my father drove a cab or was a dispatcher his whole life. Um, he grew up basically in some bad areas. I mean, he, he was just a street kid. He moved to um, the suburb of Boston when his senior year of high school, um, which was still like 10 minutes from Boston. But, I mean, it wasn't a bad, especially back then, it wasn't bad at all from what I, well, I, I guess people did fight. When I lived there, it wasn't bad. Like no one got shot or stabbed, but you had to worry about getting jumped and fights and shit like that. And that's the extent of it. Um, but a lot of people don't grow up like that. And maybe a lot of people do grow up like that. I don't know. But um, this was years ago. So anyway, to get back to the UN, the, my my point was with Harrison Bergeron is that the UN document is it's a farce. It's one, it's a front for socialism and communism, and of course, it makes it sound so nice. They had celebrities do do a commercial for it, and this is why this is how it came back under my radar 
is because YouTube, and this is this is what makes it even worse. So YouTube recommended this video, and they didn't recommend it to me when I was logged in, you know, because I delete all my shit and whatever. So they recommended it as if you go to YouTube and they don't have a history on you, they'll just put popular vi- what they'll call popular videos. But this was on there. And I guess it was made in December of 2015, which wasn't that long ago. And I'll play it. I have the audio. And you can also look it up on YouTube. But that's how I started thinking about this again. And then, of course, the other thing that we'll we'll touch on later, which has come up a bunch of times. But the fact that it's coming up again now with what's going on and it's the agenda of certain people is makes it more suspect, but they um, have the UN um, started talking about reparations for black people. I love it. How the UN though talks about the U S and something like that. And I, I'm not saying that whether it's out of line or not, and I'll get into that. I will say that if we were talking about this in 1870 or 1880 or 1890 or even 1900, there'd be no question. Definitely, rep- not only reparations, but I would seize the property of the slave owners which was huge, I believe, in a lot of a lot of uh, cases, and I would take that shit up and divide it to all the slaves, you know, and give them uh, a a piece of land so they had a place to build a fucking house. So, um, I would have done that at the same time. I would have seized all of their property. Like you want to talk about asset forfeiture now. Now, as somebody who doesn't believe in government, I'm basing it upon the times because government also enforced slavery, made laws against runaway slaves and bringing them back and all of that shit too. But at the same time, people were responsible as well by keeping slaves because if nobody kept slaves, you can't have slaves if nobody will buy them. So, but if the government made it illegal way before that, I think the majority of people would not have slaves if it was illegal and maybe none of them would have had slaves. So ultimately the government and reparations should have came from the government. But I think that, All of these people, and I know it's hard to look at a law and say, well, it was legal here and now it's not and we're going to punish you. But I would put that in in the same category as Hitler, that he made, you know, laws that made it legal for everything. They the commands they followed were legal commands at the time. But then when the U.S. overtook or not just the U.S., but the allied forces overtook um, Germany a, all of those things that were done were deemed uh, war crimes. So I would look at it the same way and seize all the property of all of these slave owners. Really what I would have liked to see back then, and there were a couple of them in this uh, Birth of a Nation, I think is based on one of them. And I remember them very well. There were three slave rebellions. Um, I can't remember one of the names, but Gabriel Prosser, Nat Turner, which I believe um, this movie is on that uh, birth of a nation, which of course the original was like a clan movie. And we talked about it in film school. And I, I don't know if I blocked it out or just don't remember. Um, I remember that it, it came up cause it was like the first, one of the first movies to be made or something or to be aired in a theater or some shit. Um, there was something about it that was the first. I, I don't remember. And, you know, film school was a long time ago. But 
I didn't have a problem with what they did. And and there was another uh, rebellion. Uh, I can't remember the other man's name. And then, of course, there was John uh, Brown. And John Brown, the thing that bothered me about John Brown is that I felt that he did it over religion. So he thought slavery was... Uh, the devil's work and all of this stuff. And, it, you know, I agree as far as how bad it was. And and it really had an effect on me when I was in junior high. That's why when I talk about all of these things like Black Lives Matter being a communist front and their agenda being the agenda of progressives and stuff like that, um, it's just being honest about what's going on and telling people because I believe in freedom for everybody. And I'm going to call out who, whatever race, uh, you know, if, it, if, if there's a movement that has to do, not that I'm calling out all black people, but if it's a movement that is mostly black, I'm not going to not say anything because, you know, I've said this before, uh, people will think I'm racist or that's racist to say that because they don't know me and they don't know what I've been through. And I've talked about a lot of it on the show and some people have heard those shows and some people haven't, but it really affected me in junior high. And I went to junior high, you know, and there was always indoctrination in schools, but I didn't, at the time I was in junior high, I don't, I didn't look at it and I don't look back on it as indoctrination at all because that's not the way they presented it. And they didn't defend any of these people. Um, I remember my teacher called, you know, Nat Turner and the Gabriel Prosser and all them like murderers and he demonized them, which I didn't, not even at the time. I said, Hey, if you're going to fucking uh, own people and treat them like that, and then they go around and fucking kill you. Because that's what uh, Nat Turner did, is he went door to door and um, killed people. Killed white people. Well, I mean, you know, they were all the white people were slave owners. I don't know if he ended up killing any non-slave owner, like poor people that were white. Um, you know, but he went to the plant. I mean... I think he was killing slave owners, but they say he killed white people, but the, all the white people, uh, all these slave owners were white. So whatever. Um, so he, uh, you know, obviously I think he killed 41 people or something. I don't know why that number sticks in my head because this is remembering eighth grade. Um, but John Brown was a white, uh, a white guy. And he went to, you know, he was the abolitionist and, I admired him, but what bothered me again is I felt like he was only doing it because he was religious. So, like, he felt, you know, he interpreted religion the way it should have been interpreted, that all people are free. And how can you say you're, you know, Christian and have and own people, which makes no fucking sense. I mean, that's why religion is so fucked up. Because how do you justify the past? And you could say, well, it's changed and it's religion. And how can religion change? Um, they keep updating religion like, oh, well, God just changed his mind on those things. Is that is that what happened? He felt this way and now he feels this way. Oh, and I also forgot to mention uh, we love to hear from you. So you can reach us via, I got to turn my Skype on. You can reach us via Skype at nonpartisan liberty for all is the username, or you can reach us at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. So, um, if you want to, I got a message about, I don't know what it means actually, but that was, uh, now we're 24 seven. So people might think that a show is live and they, they texted and, um, 
I don't know what that message meant. Anyway, um, so when we are, uh, the phone, technically, I don't carry it on me um, when I'm not on air, but you can always leave a message if you want. If you want me to address a question on air or want me to reply or something like that, that's fine. You can text me at the at uh, 702-470-7664. That's the official show line, but I don't carry it around um, all the time. I have a daytime job, obviously, and I don't make any money off this at uh, the point being. So, uh, I do have a, a show line, but I, you know, I don't keep it around with me. I, I use it specifically for, uh, to call into the show. So again, you can either call in or Skype in. The username is nonpartisan liberty for all. And of course you can go to nonpartisan liberty for all dot com and get all that information if you forget the phone number or how to contact us or the email address as well as archives articles a whole bunch of blogs and articles on there about uh, legalizing drugs and other stuff i'm trying to do that more often um, I wish I had more time and I wish I did it a lot more than I do. So I apologize for that. But with my full time job and, of course, the the radio show and I want to start doing short YouTube videos, which will probably end up being the easiest part. Not to say that people do that do YouTube videos. It's easy. I know you have to edit and, and all that stuff, but I'm talking about doing 10 minute videos not the easiest but the but it will be shorter because if i do a two to three hour show that's a long time that that takes up now if i do a 10 minute video and it all depends on how many takes and, you know and i know from like i said i have i went to film school i used to film uh everything with my video camera when i was a kid so I guess it would depend on how many takes, but if I could get it done in, you know, one or two takes and do videos that are more, um, you know, where I'm not doing a bunch of camera angles and not being all sophisticated and all that shit, I could probably get those done pretty quick, but, uh, we'll see. So those are the main things I'm going to talk about with the UN. I'll, we'll also talk about some of the history and agenda 21, which really this new document is, is really just an updated version in my opinion of agenda 21, you know? So it, it really, I think, and I haven't thought about this in a little while, but it's like things are going where Harrison Bergeron went now, not in the satir the satirical sense where, they're going to make people equal. Although I think something that they could do and they, and they did this in a movie. Um, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago when I had seen it, it's with uh, the girl from that vampire, the kids vampire movies um, where they glow during the, when it's dark out or whatever. Um, uh, that's why they lived in Seattle where it rained all the time. Uh, Twilight. The girl from Twilight's in it and some other guy. I have no idea who he is. But they're born because of the altered genetics. They're born without emotions. So they're all like equal. It's to make I think that's the name of the movie. I think it was called Equals. And it's to make everybody equal in that to an extent that nobody's emotional. Nobody can touch each other. And when they have babies, that they somehow remove the emotions. So this isn't something that I see happening anytime soon. However, with technology and how technology just goes so fast, I mean, they're already able to find, you know, birth defects and stuff like that before the baby's born. So, you know, maybe this is something 50 years out. And, and so, I mean, not that long, 
that they are, they were eight or maybe more than that because you think about being able to remove emotions but what happens is i guess it doesn't take on some people basically and and later in their life they start to develop emotions and these this couple falls in love um basically and then they invent a cure they call it a cure for it and you know, i guess you got to see the movie because i don't want to ruin it but it's that kind of same thing where it's not just about making people financially equal. It's about total equality, not opportunity, but they want everybody to be equal. So if you, if you start and let me open this document on my other computer. If you look at this document and you start to read into some of this stuff, you know, it's like, and it reminds me of this other movie with, um, and I can't think of his name right now, neither. My mind always goes blank. It's called Equilibrium, actually. They drug the people so they're not emotional. And they've been convinced that in order to keep peace, they have to be unemotional because emotions of course cause war and cause people to hate and stuff like that. So in order to eliminate wars and have peace and all of this stuff that they take medicine to eliminate their emotions. And it has a really famous actor in it. who's everybody knows. I don't know why I can't think of his fucking name. Um, Jesus, he he played uh, the guy who played Batman, Christian Bale. So Christian Bale was in it. It's called Equal Equilibrium. And um, who's the other guy? He was in like the movie The Best Man. Um, he's black. I can't think of his name. He's in it too. Um, people would know. You'd know him if you've seen him though. But it kind of goes through. You know, we want peace. We want prosperity for everybody. We want... So they have 17 different planks, basically. Uh, First, they go through all of this shit, you know. But they want total equality, equality for women, equality for all countries. And, of course, it's their sustainable development goals. So I'll go through these goals. Um, They're one sentence. here and then of course they go into more detail but i'll go into these and then we'll take a quick break and play the clip on um that the celebrities did for this document essentially it's end poverty and all its forms everywhere end hunger active food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture when you hear sustainable that's always bad just just so you know it's it's like a cold word for this is bad because it's it means that it has to be sustained so in order to sustain it there's things we're going to have to do like ration and um only use so much and all of shit like that. That's why. And they assume that without doing those things that we're going to run out of them. And there's no way with all the technology in agriculture, even with weather, climate change, of course they mention climate change. That's a huge thing for them because it's an easy way to get uh, international laws and world government and tax everybody. But Um, and get them into one of the things that was mentioned in uh, Agenda 21, sort of, um, in a roundabout way. But it's um, uh, pushed that climate change, like they won't be able to do, if you don't, we don't do anything now, it's the scare tactic. But with all the technology, even with that, you you know, it's not something I would even worry about, even if it's true that, and when I say true, true that climate change is man-made. 
Um, if they say that the climate is changing, I guess it is. I don't know. But that it is man-made. Even though world temperatures have gone down and there's evidence, it, you know, there's people on both sides, whatever. Um, but environmentalists to me are pretty fucked up people. When, and I feel bad saying that, but I understand wanting to keep water, clean water and having forests and trees. Of course, we need them for the oxygen anyway. And um, we breathe out carbon dioxide. It's like I'm talking about the environmentalists that look at the world as more important than the life of people. So meaning that, you know, if if getting rid of this forest would somehow save thousands or millions of lives, you know, it's better to keep the forest. And I think that's really fucked up. So I'm not too fond of um, environmentalists in general, but I don't want to stereotype them. I'm sure there are environment, environmentalists that aren't, I guess, fanatical environmentalists bother me. You know, people that just want clean air. I mean, I want clean air. I want clean water. I don't want polluted streams. I mean, I don't want any of that shit. Does anybody? Nobody wants that. But um, to say, well, because of this, and this is the real thing that gets me on climate change, is... Well, because of this, we're going to have to tax you a ridiculous money for your electricity. So that leads to the Agenda 21 thing of having everybody in stackable housing like, uh, what do they call it? Like projects, except worse, because they would be tiny little uh, 400 square foot stacked up housing and it'd be in little areas. So it would be a lot easier for the government to control and to monitor and all of that stuff. And then you wouldn't need a car because, of course, your jobs would be right there and your jobs would be pretty much picked for you in a sense that from a very young age, from all the data they collect, they're going to be able to predict what you're going to be best at and put you push you in that direction and essentially force you um, unconsciously or subconsciously to, that would be unconsciously, I think, to go and end up doing this job. So, um, and that's maybe getting a little ahead of myself, but let me just get through these. So, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And remember, this is for the whole world. Ensure inclusivity and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And while I believe there's gender equality in the United States, for the most part, there's different benefits that different sexes get. If you want really want to look at it, girls get, especially pretty girls get benefits that guys don't get. There's benefits that guys may get that girls don't. However, I think girls get more benefits than guys do in general. And they, I mean, all I see in positions of power at my job are women that are directors and above. That's it. Um, at least in, uh, relation to the amount of men. And I'm not going to go into where I work or anything like that. But so uh, ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. Of course, sustainable. Uh, Promote sustained, inclusive and sustainable. I mean, I've said sustainable about five times already. Economic growth full and productive employment and decent work for all build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable 
industrialization and foster innovation. Yeah, that's going to be hard to do with a lot of the other things you want to do. Reduce inequality within and among countries. Make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And if while you're listening to this, most of this is impossible if you're looking at it on a scale of do this for everybody. And this is government. Make sure you do this for everybody. Remember that while I'm going through this. And yeah, they sound nice. Everybody have this and everybody have that and everybody have this. But, you know, in reality, they don't just magically appear from nowhere. Um, Reduce inequality with and among countries. Make citizens and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. That's where you come in with the little apartments because you can't sustain big houses or uh, living in the country where, not country, but rural areas where you have to drive an hour to work or something like that. Ensure sustainable uh, consumption and production patterns. Take urgent action to combat combat climate change and its impacts. Conserve and sustainably, damn, they're using it like, is that an adverb there? I was never good with my grammar. Use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. So you got it twice in one sentence. Protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainable sustainable managed forests, combat desertification, and halt and reserve land degradation, and halt biodiversity loss. I don't know what the fuck that means. Promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. (laughs) Provide access to justice for all. And build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Well, of course we want justice for all and we want accountable institutions. But that doesn't mean it's going to magically fucking happen. Strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. So those are the 17 goals of their uh, their sustainable development goals. So we'll play this commercial and a few other clips. And when we get back, we'll get into the document. We'll get into the original um, version of this, I would say, or at least it comes from this. Uh, which we've done a show on before, Agenda 21. I mean, it's it's adding to it, if anything, or revising it or whatever you would like to call it. Because I think Agenda 21 is from 1992. Um, and we'll talk about the UN and their recommendation of reparations and I don't even know that they're sure what they mean by reparations because it wasn't very clear from what I understand um so we'll we'll try to talk a little about that depending upon how much time we have so we will be right back nonpartisan liberty for all don't forget on Mondays that the Illumination Hour airs 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern. And if you missed last night's episode, you can go to any of the various um, mentioned, um, I was, I was going to say applications, but websites, Spreaker or YouTube, um, and there's others. And you can get all the specific addresses at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. Uh, to listen to last night's episode of the Illumination Hour. And we will be right back after this nonpartisan liberty for all.com. Are you looking for a podcast that talks about life, the universe, and everything? Listen in to the Illumination Hour. Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Listen live at Spreaker.com or NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. We're also on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, and iTunes. The Illumination Hour. 
Brought to you by Nonpartisan Liberty for All Media and Radio Network. And your host, Ellen Stallone. Because a spark can illuminate the world. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We We will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will, we will live in a world where no child has died from diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if the world is hit back. We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money but to make all our lives better. We will live in the world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, progressive, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume, planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the threat of climate change. Where we restore and protect the, the life in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. We will restore and protect life on land, the forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. We're all countries and we their people. Work together in partnerships of all kinds to make these global goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations global goals for sustainable development. Let's Let's get get to work. Let's make it happen. On the 26th of June 1945, representatives from 51 countries gathered in San Francisco to sign the United Nations Charter. The intention was to prevent a repeat of the two world wars that had killed an estimated 100 million people. Today, 193 countries have signed the Charter and regularly meet at the headquarters in Manhattan to discuss matters of international importance. However, This organization, intended to safeguard our freedoms and rights as laid out in the Charter, is by its very nature undemocratic. Which begs the question, what does the United Nations do, and can it, even unintentionally, harm us? One of the main aims of the United Nations is to broker peace in war zones and prevent genocide. To facilitate this, a multinational armed force was created in 1948 to act as peacekeepers in areas of conflict, such as the Middle East and Rwanda. As of March 2016, this army has 104,773 uniformed troops around the world, a larger force than either Canada or Australia can muster. The man in charge of this sizable force is the Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations, Hervé Latsou. A French career diplomat, Latsou was appointed by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. This means that a well-equipped armed force larger than many nations' militaries is under the direct control of an unelected official. Exactly where the force is deployed is decided by the UN Security Council. 
The council consists of ten non-permanent members elected every two years, as well as five permanent members: the U.S., the U.K., France, China, and Russia. Over 60 UN member states have never been members of the Security Council. This means five nations hold arbitrary influence over where peacekeepers are deployed, who the next Secretary General will be, and the legality of international military actions. The main problem with a multinational neutral peacekeeping force that intervenes in foreign affairs is that often it is not wanted by either side of a conflict. This may be why, according to an internal UN report, peacekeepers only intervened in 20% of cases to protect civilians from harm. In addition to this perceived failure in their principal mission, UN troops have been accused of misconduct against the people they are there to protect. For example, between 2013 and 2015, French UN peacekeepers allegedly sexually assaulted 99 girls in the Central African Republic. Three of those girls were allegedly forced to have sex with animals by a UN commander. In Bosnia, peacekeepers were accused of helping traffic young women into sex slavery. Meanwhile, Pakistani peacekeepers have been found guilty of sexual abuse. With this sort of track record, the UN is finding itself unwanted in war zones, not just because of their lack of ability to end the chaos, but also due to their potential to escalate it. But if the UN is powerless to stop conflicts or is unwilling to do so, what exactly are their intentions? The budget for core UN operations in 2014 to 2015 was set at 5.5 billion dollars. However, this excludes peacekeeping, which costs an additional seven billion dollars. This has led to accusations that the UN is corrupt, that the organization is being used as another plaything by the rich and powerful, and there is certainly evidence to suggest corruption has happened in UN history. In 1995, the UN established an oil for food program with Iraq. Ostensibly to provide humanitarian aid to the beleaguered nation in exchange for Iraqi oil. However, the head of the program, Ben On Sevan, was found to have corruptly benefited from bribes when he was given oil bonds in return for special favor. At around the same time, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's son, Kojo, was accused of using his father's influence to secure a bid on a UN contract for the company he worked for. With its vast budget and independent military strength, people like author Michael T. Snyder contend that the United Nations is merely a front for the establishment of a new world order. In September 2015, the UN passed a draft agenda for global sustainability. It laid out a framework for humanity for the next 15 years. Michael Snyder alleges that, under the guise of tackling poverty and problems with the environment, causes that have universal appeal, the UN is planning to use this popular support to initiate a series of control measures over the general population. So, while the initial aims of the United Nations may have been noble, the real politic behind its creation has persisted to this day. It could be argued that the big five who sit on the Security Council pursue their own agendas to the detriment of those they claim to represent, and certainly in the last two decades, the UN have proved suspiciously toothless when dealing with international conflicts. Meanwhile, reluctant peacekeepers imposed on a reluctant population can cause more problems than they solve. Therefore, it may well be that the UN isn't so much dangerous in intent. But dangerous in potential. Dead, still living, shady reptilian characters, and some discussions that rock the very foundation of the world we're living in. No, not Halloween at your grandma's house. I'm talking conspiracy theories. Obama is set to meet with Vladimir Putin next week in New York City. That's right. Now, if you look here, look at the words that they use. President Obama and Russian President Vladimir Putin will meet Monday in New York. This will be their first encounter in nearly a year amid growing tensions between the two countries. So they're not going to meet. They're not going to talk. They're not going to、uh, conspire or work together. They're going to encounter each other. That sounds dangerous, doesn't it? Now, Putin is scheduled to be in New York for the United Nations General Assembly, where he will speak Monday. Now the United Nations has different regional headquarters and headquarter districts. 
such as Geneva, Switzerland, Vienna, Austria, Nairobi, Kenya. Hey everybody, Stacy on the right. I'm totally sitting here wondering what in the world is going on right now. So let me dig into this real quick. Apparently came out today um, that the U.S. owes black people reparations for a history of racial terrorism. Now, remember, the U.N. represents nation states that still have slavery within their borders. But, you know, don't let me get too deep in the weeds of what they, the problems they have in their own house before they start talking about Americans. Um, the article is on the WashingtonPost.com, and it says a recent report by a U.N.-affiliated group based in Geneva has come to the conclusion um, as a part of a study by the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. Now, never mind that people of African descent live all over the world. There are French Africans, there are German Africans, people from Africa or the continent of Africa, because it's not a country, they live everywhere. They live all over the globe. They're in Alaska, they're in the North Pole, they're in Iceland, they're everywhere. They may not be in huge numbers, but they are there. So everywhere you're going to find black people, you may find some history of oppression. But, I mean, again, don't let me get off into the weeds with facts and everything. So they are, and I'm quoting this article, it says, in particular, the legacy of colonial history, enslavement, racial subordination, segregation, racial terrorism, and racial inequality in the United States remains a serious challenge. Now, I had someone message me twice today on my Facebook page and say, that this is something that's been in the works for a long time. Well, I remember, do you remember when Mike Brown was shot two years ago here in St. Louis? The next year, the mom of Mike Brown, she was, her and her current husband went to the UN and they testified about the difficulties of race in America. And at that point, I thought to myself, what foolishness is this? What business do they have going to the UN and talking anything bad about America? Well, this is what it was. And mind you, understand how these cogs fit together. This is George Soros, and he's using the UN to try to enact something here in the United States, and it's not for our benefit. Once again, black people are being used as pawns to further the goals of someone who could care less about them. There's a reason why he put... Um, the, the, my daughter's coming in here with a whole bunch of music. There's a reason why George Soros poured... $33 million into Ferguson and all of that unrest. He didn't rebuild Ferguson. He poured money into Ferguson to try to um, foment unrest. And it worked. And there's a reason why this UN working group was formed. There's a reason why all of this is going on. This election is not going according to plan. Most Americans, according to polling that's out today, believe Hillary Clinton's going to win the race, but most Americans don't plan on voting for her. Now, you know the sentiment this far out from the race, usually predicts the end of the race. So whoever Americans feel will win actually wins as opposed to whoever Americans are planning on voting for. So the enthusiasm gap that we've been talking about for the Democrats, it is there. They don't have as much enthusiasm, but everyone feels as if everything's rigged and Hillary's going to win or somehow Trump's going to lose as opposed to her winning. This is all a part of what Soros wants because Hillary's a sock puppet, sock puppet for him. She will do whatever he tells her to do. Remember, he already was controlling her movements when she was in the Secretary of State position. He was emailing her. It's all on the WikiLeaks page. Just go there and read it for yourself. He was telling Huma and the other aides when he would meet with Hillary and who she would appoint to different positions around the world for ambassadorships in foreign countries. George Soros was telling her to do that. So none of this stuff about reparations through the U.N., has anything to do with anybody who looks like this. It's not for my benefit. I don't need any reparations. I don't want any reparations. The people who were actually enslaved are all dead, and the people who did the enslaving are dead. And the debt for slavery was paid when we had the Civil War. All of the blood that was shed was pound for pound for what was shed during slavery. It's over. We owe nothing more. Whites don't owe us anything, and we as black people don't owe anything. We're not owed anything. That is all paid. So, and I don't care if you're a Christian or not, that's how it works. The debt has been paid. 
Now, slavery was an abomination, and I absolutely, you know, I'm not for it. But what, what the United Nations should be doing is focusing on the 30 million people, 26 to 30 million people, most of them black, are enslaved in Arab nations around the world in the Middle East. They're enslaved right now. They're owned as property now. They're sex slaves now. Those are the people who the UN should be focused on, not well-fed, well-taken-care-of, well-treated, privileged Americans. The poorest American lives better than 80% of the people on this planet. So this is not about us. People who believe they're owed reparations, you're getting pimped. You're getting played. You're getting used. The same things you like to say about black conservatives, that's actually you. You're projecting. So make no mistake about it. I'm, I'm going to give you one more little bit of information. It's from, um, her name is Goldie Stillman. And she was saying that it's all connected to what's been happening with the UN for at least the last one or two years. Because these working groups take time. So, you know, just like any huge organization... No, no huge organization just pops up one day and says, we're going to do a working group and come out with a report. It takes years worth of fact-finding and information and meetings before the group can come up with their report, and then the report can then be given to someone in charge who can make a recommendation, or they can make the recommendation to the person in charge on what to do. So Goldie's the one who sent me the link to the Washington Post piece. And I just have to say... If you don't agree with me, if you're black and you feel like we're owed reparations, just for one second, please think about where else on this planet you can live and be and do whatever you want to be as a black person. I know it was really um, on PC what that lady said in Ohio and she lost her job, some staffer for the RNC or whoever she was working for. And she said something about if, if you haven't done anything with your life and you're black, it's your own fault. But we could say that about anybody. It doesn't matter what color you are, what ethnicity you are. If you're not doing anything with yourself, it's not some old crotchety white guy off in Iowa's fault. It's your own fault. All of the opportunities are right here. And you don't have to be rich. You don't have to talk a certain way. All you have to do is work. And every time you hear the word no, work harder. And within a certain period of time, you will be successful. Because successful people aren't successful because they're tall, thin, smart, pretty, um, white. They're successful because when they hear no, they keep working. The person who wins is the one who continues to work and improve themselves until their value is obvious and then they receive their reward. And then they keep working and then they receive more. It's earned. That's not received, but they get it in exchange for their work. So if you make yourself valuable, you will get anything that you set your mind to. And you can only do that here in America. So don't be used. Don't allow these people, George Soros and all these other people, to use your ethnicity, something you were born with that you cannot change. Don't allow them to use that to further their own goals, which is to elect Hillary Clinton, who, as she said, thinks you are a predator if you're black. You're naturally born that way, like an animal, and that you need to be brought to heel like a dog. She, her husband thought Barack Obama should be serving them coffee and getting their luggage. Joe Biden said Obama has no dialect, no noticeable dialect, and that his hands were clean. Now, like we can help that our hands are brown and that our fingers aren't perfectly clear skinned. You can't help that if you're black. So how can Barack Obama help that his hands look that way because he's biracial? They're the racists. That's why they talk about it so much. Don't get used. The UN doesn't give two craps about you because if they did, they'd be looking for people that look like us. They would be looking out for them and getting them out of slavery in the Arab world. You are listening to Nonpartisan Liberty for All Radio with your host, Dave Bourne. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in username Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Nonpartisan Liberty for All and we are back. If you'd like to listen to, or not listen to, because I played it, but if you'd like to hear, uh, here, I just said the same thing. If you'd like to see 
that commercial about the global goals for 2030, um, it's called We the People for Global Goals. So you could look it up on YouTube, and there are a bunch of celebrities in there. And the way they present it, it's kind of hard to find all of them. Some of them are just obvious, like Meryl Streep is speaking, um, Jennifer Lopez, and, but others are speaking with other people. And really, to me, it's just another way to control people. And whether it's through world government or not, it's getting those ideas out there. And I believe that the U.S. essentially has the same agenda and that the U.S. has the biggest influence on the U.N. as what I believe is still the richest country in the world. But even on the, and I don't know if he said this in this video, um, I believe it was said in the video, but I'll go, I'll go through some of the stuff said, sorry, and I'm mixing up video and audio. It was said in the audio um, of the clip that I played on the, um, it was called uh, How Dangerous is the United Nations, but it went through the history and that there are five countries on the UN Security Council that are permanent countries, and that's China, France, the US, UK, and Russia, and then there are 10 that are elected every two years. Seems kind of unfair uh, when you think about it. So I just want to go through this uh, real quickly, uh, the history, which really started with the League of Nations. And I was thinking, and I, I wrote this out, kind of as a quote, I guess, but then I thought of the banks, but it was uh, something that I've said before, and I might even post it before, that government is the only organization that can fail or do a terrible job and be rewarded for it. If It's like if an agency fucks up, they end up getting more money the next year. They need more people. It's They're never blamed for incompetence. I mean, people blame them, but I mean, they they're the government they're all together they don't blame i mean they may blame internally but they don't come out and cut you know money from them because they fucked up they give them more money and of course the banks did that too so until the banks got bailed out they were the only ones but now the uh, banks have gotten bailed out so they are also but supposedly that will not happen again. This time they'll take your money, meaning that your savings and whatever else you have in the bank. So I would be very careful about that. But just to summarize and go through the history very briefly that was mentioned in one of the clips I played, uh, if you had missed that, um, they didn't talk about the League of Nations though, but that was essentially the... UN before there was a UN, there was a League of Nations, and the U.S. wouldn't join it. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, who, and and this makes you wonder, Woodrow Wilson, who also happened to be president when the income tax amendment was passed and the Federal Reserve Act, the president was Woodrow Wilson, who also wanted a United Nations which they ended up calling League of Nations, which obviously didn't do shit because there was a World War II. So if something doesn't work, why try to redo it? I guess you could say, well, we'll try to redo it, but why? I mean, I don't know that they necessarily redid it, except that they added the United States. It was really all they did. And really what it was for is to prevent World War III. It started with 51 countries. This is all mentioned in that clip. I I heard two different dates, same year, just one said May and one said June. I think the 26th they both had. One had had May 26th, one had June 26th, whatever, Um, 1945. This was right after the war, started with the 51 countries. I don't know if all those 51 countries were already in the League of Nations, And 
as you had probably heard if you listened to the clips, there were 104 troops. I did not know this as of March 2016 um, that the UN controls. However, according to uh, somebody I know made a statement that said, you know, 10,000, not Al Qaeda, but ISIS soldiers would defeat them, meaning they're non-trained, you know, pushovers, I guess. I, I don't know. I can't validate that. I don't know enough about their troops. I would think if they had fucking AK-47s, just like pretty much what Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS and most of them, um, a lot of countries have. And uh, I'm familiar with both an AK-47 or a version of it and the AR-15, which the U.S. Army uses the fully automatic. It's a lot easier to... I think the accuracy with the AR-15 is a lot better and it's more lightweight, but supposedly an uh, AK-47, you can do whatever the fuck you want to that thing and it will still fire. Plus it fires bigger rounds, so it's going to do more damage. And you have an AR-15 that fires, you know, smaller rounds. What would actually be perfect, and they make these, is Ruger has the exact same AR-15 that shoots the ammo of an AK-47, the 7.62 by, I think, 36 millimeter. So um, it only carries 20 in the magazine instead of 30, but it um, you could probably get a bigger magazine. I don't know if it could handle that many shots that fast. That's usually why they're smaller, but I'm sure it could. So, Um, and of course, it's not automatic, so it's just how fast you can pull the trigger. But that I I like to shoot that and see how uh, see how good that is. So at some point, um, I'd probably just buy it because I have the other one, and it's I shouldn't have said that, but it's nice and. The only difference would be the changing, you know, it it would shoot the higher caliber and then I could share that with my AK-47. Anyway, um, supposedly AK-47s can, you know, you can do anything to them and they're, and they're going to shoot. I had trouble with shooting brass where it jammed, but I mean, it didn't break or anything. Although the safety, when I took, took it apart, um, one of the times the safety fucking broke broke off and then I put it back on, but it doesn't work now. So anyway, um, the undersecretary general for peacekeeping, which is appointed by the secretary general, which is now Ban Ki-moon is in charge of those troops. I, I can understand them not being well trained or well equipped, but Really, I mean, if they have, and I'm sure they have automatic AK-47s and ISIS, a lot of those fighters, they're not, they're guys they went out and fucking hired. They're they're not, you know, all uh, not every single one of them are these lunatics that can cut heads off. I mean, that's, and I, who knows if that really even happened. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Um You know, there were videos, but there was a lot of questions about that. So, and there was the issue of peacekeepers, uh, because that's what they're for, peacekeepers accused of various crimes. Now, if their whole point was to keep peace, their whole purpose, the United Nations, what the fuck are they doing all these things that they're doing, like writing uh, about sustainable development and reparations and shit like that. If if that was their goal, which supposedly it was, it was essentially make sure that there's not a World War III and try to avoid all wars, period. So their purpose was really to bring nations together so they could kind of hash out their differences and 
for the most part and then make agreements based on that if they needed to. But not to come up with things like, you know, world sustainable development or Agenda 21 or anything like that. So just like every other organization, they're created for one purpose. And, well, any government organization or government affiliated organization, which they're they are affiliated with the government because governments are members of the U.N. So. Currently, they have 193 countries, um, and again, they're supposed to safeguard freedoms and rights uh, from wars and broker peace in war zones. Where did that safeguard freedom and rights? I think now that was what... Because they, that wasn't their original, yeah. Now they're they're trying to safeguard freedom and, and rights, but it was really more to broker peace in war zones. So this is what they're doing now, as opposed to when they were formed, um, was really to make sure there's not going to be an, a World War Three. So now they're going and trying to protect individual freedom well they're not that's a bunch of bullshit because none of the things that they list really have to do with freedom for the most part maybe one or two and we'll go back and look at those but i don't look at making sure people have sustainable jobs or sustainable food the u.n is one of those, I don't even know what you'd call them, uh, organizations, I guess, that focuses on positive rights and freedoms. So, like, when they say safeguard rights and freedoms, which, again, that's a recent thing, not a when-it-started thing in 1945. But... And so is broker peace in war zones. It was supposed to be more, you know, these countries got together and met and, you know, worked out their differences, whatever, made sure that there weren't, you know, wars if they could avoid them and definitely not a World War Three, but especially with the nuclear bombs um, that a lot of countries have now. But they look at freedom and rights totally differently than what freedom and rights are. We've had discussions on the show, or maybe not discussions, but, well, actually, I think discussions, but um, we've talked about negative and positive freedoms and rights, and I've talked about it with other people, and just most of the people that I was talking to actually agreed with me, so I guess that's still a discussion, but um, that's what we do on the show is promote the ideas of freedom and liberty, not um, you know, I'm not like other shows where I want to have people on that disagree with me so we can sit and argue in order to get listeners. Um, there's so many shows that do that. If you want those opinions, you know, turn your TV on to any channel and you can get them anyway. Um, so again, to just briefly mention negative and positive rights, and I always get this wrong, but negative rights I finally got it right, are what real rights and freedoms are, meaning the right to defend yourself, the right to put what you want in your body. They're rights and freedoms that don't involve guarantees from other people for the most part. And I mean, well, maybe that's not the best way to say it, but you don't really need anything from somebody else in the most part. Like you don't need somebody to do something for you. So they would say a a right is healthcare is a right. Now healthcare requires the actual, um, what would you call it? The um, work 
I had a better word for it, but of a doctor or the, um, fuck, there was a word I had in my head that I just totally forgot. Their labor, the labor of a doctor or a nurse or whatever medical professional, it requires their labor to do that. So do you have a right to their labor? No, you don't. And they'll do that with a whole bunch of things. The one I bring up all the time, I brought it up 50 times already, is that they say they have the right to peace and uh, the right to live. And they bring that up. And what they mean, and they literally mean this when they say that about world peace. World peace means you don't own a gun. And there, the one thing that I, uh, I wrote it down in my notes, but I didn't mention so far, is the small arms treaty that Obama signed. Now, different people uh, have differing, opin- differ- differing opinions. I think I said that wrong. But um, on what that exactly means, but what I saw as it meant when they referred to small arms, that it is an international law and something leading to international law banning uh, citizens, or I hate the word citizens, individuals from having guns unless you're part of a government agency. So other people disagree and say that had to do with arms trafficking and things like that. But it almost had to do with, you know, it mentions, and and I got to go to the, the, the document and I think it's very short and open to interpretation and that's the problem. But arms trafficking, I think could be, somebody selling somebody else a couple guns. I mean, it, it, it small arms are not <laughs> something a midget has. No, small arms, uh, I, I'm sorry, I apologize to the little people. Small arms are not like, you know, when I hear small arms, I thought they were talking about like explosives and shit like that. That, you know, that's what I initially would think. But no, small arms, they mean, they're talking about guns. So they, and, and regardless of that treaty, the UN is anti-gun, except for, of course, if you work for the government, then that's fine. Only governments should have guns and people, individuals should not, unless they, of course, work for the government. But they... Uh, when they talk about those positive rights, about the right to peace and live in a peaceful society and have world peace. And I think that's in here specifically about world peace. Um, I'd have to find it, but there's something well, healthy lives and promote well being, but that's more about, you know, um, food and exercise and stuff. But I think there's something that has to do with, well, safe. They say make cities and human settlements safe. I know in the original one, and it may be in the details and not in the actual, um, oh, promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all and build efficient, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. So in that, of course, what I read is we want to ban guns, and some people will look at me like you're a nut. You don't know what you're talking about. But if I go to that goal, which I did uh, because they're calling them goals, um, sustainable development goals in this section, where it just initially list them. But if I go to the details, I guarantee you it will go more into uh, things, which I, like I said, which I did before, that will make you come to that conclusion. And they want p- 
people to essentially not be armed and they look at peaceful as you know people are not armed not that governments are not armed and that's one of the problems obviously because they're looking again at these negative rights so you look at all uh, i mean a lot of these things and i'll read through this again um and talk more about it at another time also but it's like end poverty in all forms well they say that you have the right to live uh to food to a healthy life all of these things that they list they're looking at as rights but you don't have a right to that or the, or it's not a freedom now it's a freedom to ob- be able to obtain that without government stopping you or a freedom a, a, a right to be able to buy whatever food you want without government interference it's not a right that you have food it's just it's not because where does that food come from and this is what people don't think about for one and and that's why you get a lot of millennials no offense but you get a lot of younger people um in their late teens and early 20s that have never been out on their own have never had to pay bills don't realize that and even that they think well that shouldn't be that way But if you really think about it, it should, because this is why, because everything that you have gotten or obtained or bought, somebody had to put some labor into that. Now, are they not owed for their labor? So if you want to take health care, for example, if a doctor and the government the US government has fucked up the whole healthcare system so bad um before i was born i don't and i don't even know what it was like i i got to find out from somebody that's old enough to tell me um but from what i understand i mean in the 60s you didn't need insurance because you could afford to pay for a fucking doctor or an operation or um all of these things. And I know Ron Paul has talked about that being a physician, you know, back years ago and what happened. I have no idea. It's an, there's so many things that come up and that's why, you know, for me, it's, I wouldn't say harder than most people. Cause there's a lot of people that do shows that work full-time jobs, but I have for me and people like me, that are trying to fight for true freedom and liberty and doing shows. And we're not getting paid for these shows. um, And we're working full time. And, and what I'm, the only reason I bring up, we're not getting paid is we have to work another job because we're not getting paid. So we can't put all our time into it and do all these research, all this research or hire people to help us. Like Rush Limbaugh probably has like 20 people on staff. Now he of course is an extreme example because he has a multi-million dollar show. But the local show uh, in Las Vegas of the that douchebag um, that lives here, uh, Wayne Allen Root, probably, now I know he writes books and does this and that. I, I'm sure he doesn't do shit for his show, that he just has, you know, the, the station. He tells, you know, he has interns and this and that. And they just do all the research for him. And there you go. And when it comes to what's going on in the news and sets all that up for him, when people like not just me, but other people that have shows out there um, that don't have the time to do as much as they'd like and, and read half the day about what they're going to talk about and do all these things 
because they have other jobs and, you know, they can't get people to work for free to be researchers. Although I, I did have somebody for a little while helping me out a little. Um, but, and some of them can, I guess. Um, I've had times where I've had people that co-hosted, you know, and stuff like that. And, and of course, Ellen does her show and I don't pay her. Um, but we're at a disadvantage and there's so many things that come up that I wish I had the time to really get into the detail and I could, you know, do a four hour show and come at these motherfuckers from so many different ways. I mean, the government come at them from, uh, you know, all these different aspects, which I do anyway, because I know a little about a lot, but I don't have enough information a lot of the time because I don't have the time to get all the detail to intelligently speak about it. And if I do um, talk about something that I don't know enough about, I'm going to get called out on it. And I have before. Although I thought I did enough research on it. Um, I kind of disagreed on that one. I just thought I came off badly. I agree with that. I, I thought I came off really badly. But um, I don't have the time to put in, you know, and I don't want to take just a fucking Wikipedia um, page that, is all of Wikipedia is entered in by people, just regular people. So to me, I need multiple sources, multiple articles, and then you look at those, you analyze those, you look at how it relates to other things, and then you draw your own conclusions as well. And the conclusion I draw with the UN and what it's doing here is really presenting the agenda that is parallel with the U S agenda, which is why I think this report came out when it did now about reparations. Now it's been talked about before reparations, but this is not just about reparations. This was a report uh, about black people's, specifically being uh, their rights being violated, that they did a study on people of African descent in the U S and are concerned about human rights violations. Now I would say they're on the outside looking in, but, there are some human rights violations. They talk about the police. But one thing that people forget, and this doesn't make anything better or improve the system, and anybody that knows me knows I'm straight up anti-police. I think the police should not exist. But most of these people do get money in civil uh, hearings. So... We get fucked on all fronts, right? So we get fucked, and, and I don't want to even put it that way because that's kind of a fucked up way to put it as far as the person getting killed. I mean, that's a tragic death where somebody gets murdered by a cop. That's bad enough. Now, the family deserves money, and but they don't get it from the police budget. They don't get it from the cops. It's very hard to sue a cop individually, although people try to attach them as well. Um, they have so many protections legally that it never comes out of, you know, they don't lose any money on it. I think they should be totally bankrupted. But it gets paid by the government, which is the taxpayers. So then people get fucked on that too, because they have to pay for what the police did. Now, granted, I still think the people deserve the money, 
because the, you know, in cases where police just straight up murder people. But if those people are getting money that way, you wouldn't give them reparations because that's their compensation. Although money can never, of course, bring somebody back. It's not a, you know, here's your, you know, it's like a consolation. It's, it's, it's something that, you know, okay, you got money out of it, but it, 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 it doesn't bring that person back unless, you know, you really didn't give a fuck about your son or wife or whatever, or whoever the person that died. And I guess that's could be more common in married couples, to be honest, like, like, uh, them not giving a fuck and then getting money out of it. And like, damn, I got some money out of it. And I'm, I wanted to get rid of this motherfucker anyway, but it, you know, most of the time, the parent, at least the parent that is involved in the kid's life, or they're not a kid, but the person's life, um, would obviously much ra- rather have that person there, you know. And then, of course, there's whether it's um, the parents that get the money, or if they have kids and the money goes to wife and kids. Or there are women that get murdered by police, too. So whether it goes to the husband and kids or parents or whatever, um, they deserve that money. But they're getting that money that way. So I don't know that you can base a whole... uh, If they're basing reparations off of things like that as well... And people are being compensated through the court system, then you can't, it shouldn't really be looked at that way. And of course, they they talk about in this one article, and this is from January, and then they came out in September. That's why people started talking about it recently. And I think that's why people started talking more about this than they have in the past when they talked about reparations for slavery specifically. Now, as I was saying earlier, I mean, reparations should have came a long time ago to actual slaves. And I think part of them should have came from plantation owners. Um, They should have had their plantation. And I don't know what happened to plantation owners um, after the civil war, but they should have had their plantations taken and split up because from what I understand, a lot of those plantations were fucking big. You, and, and another thing that somebody had brought up is the fact that first of all, the majority of people did not own slaves, not just because they didn't want to. So I, I, I don't know that I'm going to give credit. And, and first of all, we're only talking about the South. Now, that doesn't mean in the North treatment wasn't bad in certain areas. And I don't know enough about how, you know, I, I read Frederick Douglass's book and his autobiography and how, how he was a formerly a slave and he was a what I got out of it was he was a highly respected member of society um, in Massachusetts when he finally had gotten away and, and um, became a scholar. And I don't know what he did, but he was very well respected. So I don't know how it was. I know there was still segregation in schools because I was thinking about this today. So how bad was it in the North and was it just segregation? I mean, I know I've seen racism in Boston, you know, recently, I mean, not that recently, but you know, high school, um, which wasn't that long ago. I mean, it wasn't the type of racism, like people getting killed or hung or something, but you know, it was, uh, 
words and I, I genuinely saw hate. Now I didn't see hate like they wanted people to die, but I saw hate from not a lot of people, but there were people that had that hate. And that's how I define racism. Now I know people, different people define things differently and the word racist gets thrown around and people say racism is about the uh, institutional racism and all of that and power and all that stuff. And I don't look at it that way. I look at racism as people that hate other people strictly based on their their race the color of their skin and their features and that's where it gets dangerous um i don't necessarily think that as much as i you know think cops are pieces of shit that they hate black people i think as i've said before they stereotype and discriminate. I think that they look at black people as criminals. So they might dislike them or have that, you know, the same attitude they'd have towards someone they look at as a criminal. So I I think that it's more that than anything, that they're fucking pussies and they think every black person's a criminal So they got to protect themselves and they're quicker to pull a gun on somebody they think is a criminal. And I think cops look at me and think I'm a criminal Um, and that's or have in the past. And that may have accounted for things that have happened. There's also the cops that, you know, it's not just about that. I mean, you have old ladies and uh, people that just get harassed and the power trip, the cops are on a, you know, that whole power trip thing that they treat everybody that way, no matter how you act towards them. So it's, it's gone beyond all of that. Um, But as far as the UN, that, that woman who was black that I played a clip of did have a good point about, you know, who are the UN to really say shit when, you know, look what they're doing. But should reparations at this time be given? I mean, there was discrimination after that, especially in the South. Should it be given as a blanket to anybody who is of black descent, African-American descent? No. Um, I... No, and should it even been be given out at all at this point? Uh, and how would you find descendants of, well, if you're a descendant of a slave, then you get something? And see, the reason, if you kind of look at things and you look at what's going on now with government media in the U.S. government, what's going on in the U.N. and with this it's kind of replicating what's going on there because they talk about all the black people getting killed, unarmed black people getting killed, but there's a whole bunch of unarmed white people that were killed as well, or uh, people that were armed with non-lethal weapons or, you know, uh, situations that the police had no right to shoot them Um, or they beat that uh, homeless man to death. And there's a lot of them because I've looked at the, looked at them and looked at the details. And that girl just kills me because she was so young and, um, she, she was kind of attractive too, actually, but she was a kindy, no, uh, not a kindergarten teacher, a preschool teacher, 19 years old. Um, and I can't think of her name. I always forget it. Um, maybe I subconsciously want to. But she was shot point blank when the cop jumped on her windshield and shot her and killed her because she was at a party out in the woods. And the the cop claims he he told them to stop 
but you can see on the dash cam the cop and then the cop walking towards their car and it they easily um that's a valid point that that if they couldn't hear him because you could see easily that he was for further enough away if they had their um windows up which I, i think it was raining and music on or even they were just talking that they they didn't hear him and they just kept going and they probably didn't want to stop anyway so they're like well did he say something i don't know and then he comes in and and even by his injury which i had said um his foot got run over like he he jumped in front of the wheel and then jumped on the windshield and then shot her point blank and said he was gonna uh she wouldn't stop and he was gonna kill her even though all the witnesses in the car say different and it's you know he just had to say i fear for my life and um you know the innocent girl gets killed and i know they say well they tested her later and said and i don't even know if i believe this shit anymore like they had just said uh one of the guys who was killed which shouldn't have been killed um where people tasered him and the one woman shot him and killed him that he he was on PCP. How do you know if that's even true? Bill Clinton had a coroner in Arkansas, and this is a fact, that covered up, and you can look at this, this had to do with the Iran-Contra, and when uh, planes full of cocaine were flying in the MENA, Arkansas, and I did... Um, shows on this so you can go back and listen to them and they were only a few weeks ago they're not that old and he basically kept this coroner on because he owned this coroner so i don't know they said i mean and even if she did it would have it's not a big deal that they said marijuana in her system and who knows when she actually smoked it because they don't know. It could have been weeks ago or she could have had a couple, you know, she could have been at that party for hours and that her blood alcohol level, it, I don't think it was even over the legal limit or if it was, it was like just barely over the legal limit. It was right at the, you know, so it's not like she was wasted neither. So of course they uh, bring that up. They don't bring up anything about the officer and his record um but either way it's it's irrelevant and i wish i could think of her name i keep thinking of jessica uh, samantha ramsey is her name so you can look that up and he was charged with nothing they put him in front of a grand jury he said you know i was in fear for my life blah 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 cops don't get charged man And when they do, look what happened with the cops in Baltimore because they're being prosecuted by someone who doesn't want to prosecute them. And then they have a judge giving the jury instructions who doesn't want them found guilty. So same thing in a grand jury, which is just to indict them. They have some, the prosecutor doesn't want them prosecuted and the judge doesn't either. So that's, Uh, how it works if they even get past there they're usually found not guilty you know occasionally you'll see a cop found guilty but it's very rare even the ones that beat the homeless man to death they beat him to death they got off they were indicted because i think there was no way that you can just not indict them and keep any illusion of freedom i don't know how you can keep an illusion of freedom now with every cop gets off but it's not what happens is is that a lot of black people that don't know what's going on that five or so four to five people a day are getting killed of all races and the police are getting off when they kill white people as well think that or they just hear stuff from government media the way they have it planned out is, uh, you know, because government controls what I call government media, which is, you know, people refer to mainstream media, that it's the police. It's that police get away with with pretty much everything unless, you know, 
it's somebody that has to be, you know, part well, one of the elite. And that would probably never happen because the cop would know in the process or, well, I guess if they, I was going to say after they, you know, do something, but they would make it evident somehow I would, I would think so. Um, yeah. Or, I mean, those people, cause I'm talking about the elite elite, those people run around with bodyguards and a bunch of other people. So, you know, it's not, it's not going to happen. And another thing that I was watching this documentary on between rich and poor people and how I guess Chelsea, Staten Island, Chelsea and Staten Island, New York, and I'm not that familiar with New York, but they kind of bought out like gentrification, bought out all these places. And they're still like a, uh, you know, and raise the price and, and there's a rich school and right across the street is the projects. And that one of the kids that live there who was actually going to college and everything was even saying, you know, it's not about, it's not even about race, really. It's about class. And there's a higher percentage of white people that have money. But what about, so in looking at this report and them factoring in all these other things. Now, first of all, um, the police thing, most of those people get compensated through the courts. They, they do. That's how they, you know, try to make people happy. I don't know how, you know, they know the person that murdered their loved ones walking around, but oh, we'll give you money because we don't give a fuck about money try to shut you up or whatever. And so you take that out of it. And also, like I said, you have all races that that's happening to. You can't really count the police, but you do have other things that happened after slavery and Jim Crow and what happened um, during the civil rights movement and when, what not. But what part of that was government which some of it was and what part of that was racist white people. So definitely slavery was government and a lot of these laws, the segregation laws, it was all government, but the, a lot of the killings were actually partially government. Cause if you consider the sheriff's office back then, um, in the sixties and they were, you know, police were killing people back then and hanging people with the Klan. Um, so I, I think it's hard though to base it upon, you know, those things. I think slavery is clear cut that reparations are due you know, right after the fact. And I wouldn't have a problem with that, except that nobody that's alive today owns slaves. And as I was saying, a very small, I mean, I don't know the percentage of slave owners, but your average person didn't own a slave because they couldn't afford it. It wasn't like every person owned a slave. No one owned a slave in the States that it wasn't legal and nobody owned a slave in the South that didn't have money. And then look at all the rednecks now that are poor and don't have money. So I don't even know what percentage of people actually own slaves. That's not to say that there weren't a lot of slaves because of the people that did own them, a lot of them owned a whole lot. So it was, I think it was just more concentrated where you had the slave owners instead of, you know, a million people or 10 million people owning one slave each, you know, you had a million people owning uh, or, you know, 100,000 people owning 30 slaves each on average or more. So I think it was more concentrated 
from what I've seen and and heard from history, but to go back and do that now, you're essentially holding people accountable that had nothing to do with it. And you're the whole country at, at, you know, at that same time. I mean, you'd have to go back. And this wouldn't even be fair neither, but you'd have to go back on both sides and say, well, your relatives were slave owners. But unless they had money now, if they had family money because of slave owners, so say that, you know, their relatives were slave owners and now they're still millionaires. I mean, that's really the only case I would say to, you know, have their tax money or a lawsuit or something like that. But how can the people now be responsible for what people that they were related to, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, how can you hold them responsible? And that's the whole thing. And nobody that's alive today was a slave. And on depending on where you lived and your age, you know, the amount of racism that you might have experienced is not much compared to what they went through. You know, yeah, you can say people can call you names or um, there's not so much of outside of the government, you know, courts and police, there's not a huge amount of expressed racism. It's more, you know, people keep it quiet or talk to their white friends or something, but it's what names or somebody gets followed around in a store, which has happened to me or can't get a cab or doesn't get a job. But, you get to a point where people have the right to, again, it's, it's the concept of freedom as long as they're not interfering with your freedom. So if they're not attacking you or stealing from you, they have the right to feel that way. And the same with black people. If they, don't like white people. Now, I don't agree with white people or anybody who doesn't like somebody because of their race. But all I'm saying is people have the right to. And that's where the UN document to me gets into the Harrison Bergeron thing is it's like world peace and everybody loves each other and all of this shit that is not realistic. And it's not just because of things like racism. It's like people don't like people based on their personality sometimes. Sometimes people just don't like people. They just, the look in the, on their face. I, I don't, I mean, it's ridiculous shit the way some people are. But people sense things about people and just don't like certain people or don't like certain things they do or the way they dress or whatever. And that's their right to do that as long as they don't take it to another level. Now, if they take it to another level, obviously, where they're attacking them, then that's another issue or they're stealing from them. But they have the right to do that. And going back to the U.N., I I guess to leave uh, my to really summarize my opinion on reparations, I think they should have been done a long time ago. I think to do them now, you can't really do it. Not to say that they're not deserved. I mean, somebody deserves something for what? slaves had to go through but i i just i don't know how you do that now i think it should have been done back then and the through both the government and the plantation owner and i think this is being done now because of the agenda 
of using and exploiting um, black people that are getting killed by police. Now, again, white people are getting killed by police too, but focusing on that and creating groups like Black Lives Matter and having them funded by these white progressives who are putting their agenda, the white progressives' agenda, within their platform along with other things and exploiting what's going on. And this is another thing to add to it. And at least from the side of the reparations. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. I don't think you can really do anything except as if a case comes up where you feel that you were wronged, um, like when cops murder people, you know, you sue them. And from what I understand, most of the time people are getting money for that. And I mean, that's really all you can do. Um, besides, you know, I think people should look at what's really going on because to look at the police and have somebody murdered by a cop that you love and then support a communist organization or a front a, a, a organization that's fronting for communism. Communism is going to make your life 20 times worse. You're going to have more police and more laws and it just, it doesn't go together. So you can either have those police running your life and having to obey them, or you can have socialism and communism where, yeah, you get, you know, money and maybe free housing and, you know, the same uh, redistribution and everybody's made equal as po- as much as possible. But you're restricted on everything. The government controls everything, meaning they have people, enforcers, whether they call them police or they call them something else, which I bet you they would change the name so people wouldn't, um, you know, association. They wouldn't look at them as police. But that's what they would be. So you can have one or the other. You can't have both. So that's really my, I guess, comments on the reparations aspect of it. Now, going back to, uh, I mean, Agenda 21 is really about control in in world government, really, um, and getting people to install a world government, which would be a huge oligarchy, because, of course, if you have eight billion people and you have, say, I don't know, 5,000 running the world, you have no say. And that's how it is now in the U.S. and probably most other countries as well. But people just don't realize it. But a world government, you know, makes it a lot more obvious. But some people want that as well. Um, They want a world government. But everything is dictated to you by the bureaucracy, just like is happening now. So that's why I'm looking at this and it's mirroring what the U.S. wants to do, essentially, within the U.S. itself. So I don't know if it's a, okay, do this in the U.S. From there, we move slowly to a world government and do the same things because that's what it is is it's instead of people take countries and it's this country just giving resources redistribution of wealth among countries and making every country equal and having this country fund this but you have to give up what you have and what you worked for to do this in this country 
And then you say, well, how come this country is so fucked up in the first place? Well, part it depends on the country. Part of it may be that it was a uh, territory of another country like England that fucking sucked its resources dry and then, you know, it was left in shambles. But at the same time, you know, how come you have a country like the U.S. that is a young country and in 240 years, you know, if you're counting from 1776, is the richest and, I guess, most successful country in the world up to this point. And a lot of people will say because of its freedom, although at the time it was probably, as I talk about levels of freedom, had a much higher level of freedom than uh, all these other countries. But that still doesn't give you the freedom that you were born with. It gives you a level, higher level of freedom. Um, it's like on the documentary I mentioned that, um, I think I mentioned it. I might have not. But of people becoming citizens, or I think I started to, that they look at the U.S. as this great country because they came from shit. One woman was talking about how she came from a communist country. And one woman actually said how they don't have, uh, or not woman, guy from Jordan said, well, they don't have checkpoints everywhere and all this shit. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> it depends where you're at, motherfucker, because they're starting to have more and more checkpoints. And for things other than DUI, I heard that in some states they have license checkpoints to see if you have a license. And he said, because they were asking, why do you like the United States? So they're, they're like, the freedom, the freedom. Well, your country must have been pretty fucked up. But, but just because something is fucked up does not mean that you should say, well, at least we're better than this. That's like saying, well, you know, you should stay with your husband because he only beats you. You know, uh, this other lady's husband, um, you know, killed her. So, you know, your husband's a lot better than hers. No, it's... um. And at the same time, uh, that level of freedom is going down and down and down. And, of course, they, I believe, have a plan in which the ultimate goal is to control every aspect of your life. And that's what it is. And the U.N., and you see how they get all the celebrities behind it, but they are trying to do it and make it sound great. Yeah. End poverty everywhere. And you know, all of these things, but it's not as easy as it sounds. And you're talking about, again, it would take a lot of control, make cities and human settlements, inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. What do you think would go into that? Besides urban planning and probably having those uh, nice little 400 square foot apartments. Banning guns. Having police. A bigger presence of police. You know, these type of things. Having government more involved in your life. Which people keep forgetting about the fact that we're being spied on. Do I have to remind you every fucking minute? I should just have a thing that scrolls across the screen that says something about the fact that all of this is being recorded. It's nice how some laws actually, some laws, some states have laws that you have to tell somebody you're recording. But that doesn't apply to the government. Um, so... They go through these sustainable development goals and then go into detail. But I think this all kind of started with 
I mean, they might have had this in the works way before that, and I'm sure they did. But as far as releasing the documents with the Agenda 21, which had to do with sustainable development and all of that shit, a lot of the same type things that... um, Here, I have the chapter. I mean, Agenda 21 is called the same thing for sustainable development. And it was from the 1992. It's actually called Agenda 21. It's 351 pages. And it goes through social and economic dimensions, a conservative and management of resources for development, strengthening the role of major groups, means of implementation. And that's where I should really go. But um, the sections of means of implementation are financial resources and mechanisms, transfer of environmentally sound technology, cooperation and capacity building, science for sustainable development, uh, like climate change, um, promoting education, public awareness and training, national uh, mechanisms and international cooperation for capacity building in developing countries, international institution arrangements, international legal instruments and mechanisms, information for decision making. So, and then it goes into the details of that, but that's a pretty long document. I would suggest looking at both of them and you know, seeing how they have progressed, which I will try to do and maybe do a show on Agenda 21 versus uh, what they've done in this 35 or 33 page document of uh, sustainable development for the next 15 years. But I remember reading it, and I don't know what changes they've made because I haven't read the final uh, draft. But I remember reading it in, like I said, I think like 2014 at some point and coming across it. It might have even been before I started doing the show, and then I um, ended up doing a show on it later. But it was pretty scary, you know, when I first saw it. Um, I was like, what the fuck? And of course you had John Podesta was the guy from the U S I, I don't know what position he was in at the time, but a lot of people might've heard his name. He was the representative from the U S who, uh, had signed off on, on this. So, and again, I, I think this is pretty much what the U S wants to do because again, the goal is, controlling every aspect of everybody's lives and you can do that by and they they want to do that by you know socialism and making everybody as equal as possible and they talk about that too you know making it's like making everybody equal and that's a right that everybody is equal and no not everybody is equal everybody should be treated equally under the law And really, I believe that the only thing that should be equal is that you have the freedom to do whatever you want, except assault, rape, or do anything physical to another person or their property. So everybody should have that equal freedom including self-defense um, and being able to, you know, lethal self-defense if it calls for it in that circumstance. Um, that being the only way that you have a right to violate um, it, physically assaulting somebody. But besides that, that's really all your owed um and it's essentially natural law but that's the only you know freedom and there there are a bunch of freedoms that come under that but if you want to summarize it you know like the freedom to put whatever you want in your body the freedom you could get more detailed in it but 
if you were to summarize it, I mean, that's what it is. It's not the freedom to have people help you. It's not the freedom to have people give you money if you can't afford food. It's not the freedom to have people feed you. It's none of that because those aren't freedoms or the right. Those aren't rights. You don't have a right to be fed or be, I mean, We've talked about, okay, you know, if you're a kid and your parents and whatever, there's certain, I think, obligations that they have. But besides that, and, and speak, you know, speaking of, if we're speaking of just adults, although I believe kids, uh, their rights are totally fucking trashed all the time, but but that's all we have for tonight, all the time we have for tonight. I could talk for a lot longer, but I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. And tomorrow we will be back uh, with Ken Shorjan of The Daily Economist, also of Ken Shorjan on YouTube. So check out his uh, YouTube channel and his website, uh, dailyeconomist.com, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Have a good night. If you do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get the tickets. We force them. But at the end of the day, each and every man can go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer. The way the system...